Hello, everyone, and good morning. It's such a pleasure to be back on a slush stage for another year. I'm Eleanor. I'm deputy editor of Sifted, and I'm here with Johanna, co-founder of a very exciting company, Finnish company Relics. And we're here to talk about your very long journey to where you are today. Um, would love to just kick off, Johanna. Talk me a little bit through the journey of the company. How has the business model evolved to today, and what was your biggest pivot? Yeah, so Relax is actually based on research. Um, we were all the three co-founders, researchers to begin with. Then we felt that research is a very slow way to change the world. So we decided to take some of the ideas we had and see if we can actually make them work in the real world. And one of those ideas was automated store replenishment. So doing forecasting of demand and then making sure that the goods arrive at the right time in the right quantity to stores automatically. And uh, this is the idea we started with. And originally we thought that we just developed this black box intelligence, put it onto the back-end systems and optimize things. You wouldn't even need a UI or anything. And that's when we pivoted in a major way, because when we had the chance to look at these back-end systems, we realized that they were really stupid. There was nothing to optimize. So we had to make the decision to either go into consulting mm -hmm. or then build the whole thing the forecast engine, the supply chain optimization ourselves, and kind of deliver mission-critical software to retailers. And then we were like, well, how hard can it be? And now we've spent almost 20 years doing that. So tell me a little bit, we're talking about retail, but what kind of like, you know, industries, what kind of retail are we talking about to paint a picture a little bit? Yeah, nowadays we actually cover the whole kind of consumer goods supply chains. So retail, wholesale and distribution centers and manufacturers. But we focus mostly on kind of large volumes, fast moving consumer goods like food and beverage, that sort of thing. Um, because that really is the optimal playground for optimizing things. If you have large volumes and are able to impact them, the business case is just huge. And a personal favorite is grocery, because you have food product and can really have a massive impact on spoilage, which is kind of a business problem, but also a huge sustainability problem. Completely, completely. So I think another really interesting part of your journey is that you were bootstrapped for so long, right? Just building a great business, flying under the radar. And I think that there's been a lot more spotlight shed on bootstrapped companies in Europe recently, too. What were some of the benefits of being a bootstrapped company? What was so great about that? Yeah, so basically we bootstrapped for 10 years. So that's a fairly long time. Um, the thinking behind this was that in the early years, we felt that it would probably be more, you know, we would spend the same amount of time and energy speaking with the investors as we would need to speak with clients to collect those couple of hundred grand. And we felt that we would learn so much more being out on the field. So, and it worked out. Then we did go for investment when we decided to go into the US market. So we knew that that would require more money that we could have cash flow for otherwise. But the benefit obviously is that, especially in the early years, you have this freedom of operation. So if you need to change things quickly, you can do it without asking anyone. So basically three co-founders getting together and be like, ah, oh, that doesn't work, let's drop it, let's move on with this thing. Um, and of course, then when negotiating funding, you're in a completely different place when you have a track record of profitable growth for 10 years. So that also gives you leverage going forward. The downside, of course, is that you have to be super scrappy. So for many years, the majority of all prospecting and selling happened through us co-founders and especially our CEO, Mikko. So basically, we did have the leanest, meanest, 
sales and marketing machine because it cost next to nothing. But that was a kind of key requirement of being able to pull this off. So still today, um, I think many um, out there see us as the new kid in town because they did not hear about us for the first 10 years. Interesting. I would love to delve into that a little bit more too. Like, was it actually a little bit of a challenge not having that brand out there? And how did you overcome that? You know, when you're going in and meeting a potential new customer, how did you really convince them that you, you were the partner that they needed? Yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. So in the like really early days, we had these two logos that we tried to put on a PowerPoint slide to look like plentiful. So I think we just needed to be very clever about removing risk from our clients. And um, we had a few different tools that we actually still use today. So a kind of business case calculation based on their exact store item level data from several years and be able to in detail show what the implications are going to be. So that kind of increase security before you actually go into the implementation. And then we had a lot of tools like um, money back guarantees on, on, on the pilots being successful and that sort of thing. And then of course the whole SaaS model was new back then so that you wouldn't have to take a leap of faith and pay, you know, five years up front and then be like, I hope this works. So I think there were a lot of good stuff that we had to do that's still quite useful today. That's super powerful. So you alluded to it a little bit before when you were talking about your journey that when you decided to go to the US, you thought, OK, we actually need a little bit more firepower behind us. And so we're going to bring in outside investors. Talk me through how you found the right investor. How did you do due diligence on investors? Yeah, now we actually have three different investors on board, but the first one was, of course, in one sense, the biggest steps, and the criteria have shifted a bit along the journey. But that first one, we thought that because we were entering the US, we felt that a good investor would help us build credibility in the US. So we wanted a US company, but with European presence for you know making things practical. We also wanted someone who really knows software and SaaS so that they kind of understand the business dynamics without having to explain that to them. And we also wanted someone who had a track record of holding on to investments for longer times when it made sense, because we didn't want to be forced into an exit event just because there were some fun deadlines. So those were some of the things we were looking at. Interesting. And how did you have any thoughts about, you know, growing? Obviously, when you bring on an outside investor, that can impact your mission and the amount of control you have over your company. How did you kind of balance, or how are you still balancing the needs of the investor versus how, your vision for how you want to build the business as well? Yeah, I think we've taken in investors that have kind of a shared vision of where we are going. So I haven't felt that the investors would have been forcing us in any particular direction. They have been very open to our vision. I think they have brought with them um, more focus on, for example, the financials, something that would have been a natural path anyway, as the kind of scale and complexity grows. But they've also been uh, able to you know, put forward some tough questions in board meetings, for example, and that's actually been quite helpful. So even if you kind of disagree with the argument, then you have to explicitly argument why, and that brings clarity, and that's super important. Can you tell me a little bit about some of those difficult questions? What are some of the areas that you found that they really got dug into that were helpful for you? Yeah, so it's, I think most of the questions have been related to potential expansion areas. Mm -hmm. So, of course, over the great years we've expanded our offering and then kind of debates on should we go in this direction or in that direction and is there sufficient market here, is that more lucrative, what are our differentiators in the different opportunities. So that kind of discussion is actually super valuable. So how have you thought about geographic expansion from your earliest days? Obviously you started here in Finland, but then how did it work from there? 
Yeah, so um, the first international expansion is my baby. I'm Swedish speaking, so I didn't see a lot of internationalization happening in the company. So I picked up the phone and started cold calling the Swedes. <laughs> and then when I got that going, I, I moved on to Norway and Denmark and so on. And at the same time, we then went for the big uh, European markets like the UK and, and Germany and so on. Now we have pretty good coverage of Europe. Um, the US is a major market for us. And then in the last, let's say, three years, we've also expanded into Latin America and Asia Pacific. And actually Asia Pacific is really growing yeah. super nicely today. That's very cool. I think another kind of question on a lot of founders' minds right now with a more difficult fundraising environment is how can they build a capital efficient business and how can they eventually build a profitable business? How have you guys thought about those two things, profitability and capital efficiency? Yeah, for the first 10 years, we basically didn't have any choice. We had to be profitable. Um, and I think that fosters a good culture of understanding both, you know, cost and profit drivers mm -hmm. and being quite careful about how you spend money. Um, and I think that's been super helpful. So just understanding what happens if things change. And we really got to kind of prove that point when the pandemic started because um, we quickly created a scenario, a kind of doom and gloom scenario. This is if everything goes like massively oh wrong. Yeah. Uh, what do we have to do to survive this? And we took action really quickly. So already in like April, May, when, when this whole thing just started to kind of evolve, uh, we took action to reduce costs okay. with the aim of if we don't sell anything this year and some of our you know, clients go bust, we would still make it. And to be able to have that control is super important. So we basically turned from uh, doing a loss to becoming profitable in the first year of the pandemic. And now we've switched back to investing again because we feel comfortable doing that. But of course, with the current macroeconomics, we still have like a few different scenarios in our pocket and have that kind of constant vigilance that if, if this is what we're starting to see, then we'll have to take specific action. Definitely, definitely. What other advice would you give to founders other than, you know, really making those scenarios, talking those out with the board and with the other leaders in the business? What advice would you give for founders around how to build that sustainable business and move towards profitability? Yeah, it's, I hate giving advice because that's where my research background comes in. I have one data point. I have a relax data <laughs> point and I would not want to extrapolate that, you know, this thing that worked for us would work for others. So maybe my advice is that when you take advice, Try to think about the context where that comes from. Some of it, it's going to be applicable and other stuff, not so much. And that's, mm -hmm. you need to have that judgment. Other people will not tell you which advice is good and which isn't. Yeah, I think that really applies to your journey too as a business. You know, it's not the traditional journey of a tech startup or a company that we hear in the news, like on Sifted, right? And so it's refreshing to be able to hear your data point, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I once spoke with some students and gave a short presentation about Relax and then the questions. First question is, did you not think of anything cooler? <laughs> than this when you started your business. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm a geek. I really enjoy <laughs> supply chains. I love that. I guess the other kind of side of the sustainable growth coin, because we're here today to talk about that sustainable growth journey, is your relationship with your customers as well, right? Is how well you adapt to them, how well you listen to them, right? That sets you on the path for sustainable growth. How have you worked together with your, with your customers to give them the best experience? Yeah, so I think there's two components to this. One is kind of customer satisfaction, which you measure through surveys and asking them and so on. But the other key thing is delivering value. And uh, in many cases, that's actually even more important. 
So they make a sizable investment with some expectation about the benefits. And actually, surprisingly often, we push the clients to measure those benefits. Mm. Sometimes they can be a bit like, well, everything works, it's fine. And then we go in, but yeah, you actually need to measure. You need to measure your inventory levels. You need to measure uh, product availability. You measure all these things, and you're going to get them out of the system. I'm going to show you. So we really want them to have focus on that value, because mm. that's ultimately why we are doing what we do. And that's ultimately why they bought what they bought. So then it's kind of a joint responsibility to make sure that it actually happens. Totally, totally. There's another like, interesting part of your business too that we touched on a little bit at the beginning, which is the sustainability angle, right? And how the work and the software that you create is doing such a big contribution to that. How have you seen the attitude of these big corporates that you work with change towards sustainability? And how have their needs changed when it comes to that? Yeah, I think we've benefited a lot from not pushing it as a sustainability thing, but as something that kind of has immediate business impact. So that's one thing I like about our kind of domain, is that efficiency goes hand in hand with better commercial results, so profitability, but also with sustainability. There's basically never a trade-off between these, so you improve all of them at the same time. Um, and that makes it easy to kind of, one client is more focused on profitability. Well, great, we're going to deliver some sustainability anyway, and the other one has actually some targets for sustainability, mm -hmm. and then they are going to be keen on measuring that impact. But this is kind of a win-win-win situation, so that makes things a lot easier. I think it's only in the kind of recent years that companies have started to put forward actual targets for sustainability, but sustainability is such a broad field that it's it's, most companies are still kind of grappling with how do we even get data on these things? How do we understand what to focus on in this kind of complex mess of things? Totally. And how did that evolve for, for you and for Relax in your journey in terms of talking about sustainability? Was that something you really focused on at the beginning? Or was it more like, okay, here's how we can help you optimize? And then the sustainability narrative kind of came later. How did that evolve? Yes, I, I would say very much so, because the business implica implications of food waste are huge. So if you let products kind of flow through a long, complex supply chain, to only, you know, in the store, be thrown away. It's like throwing money into the garbage bin. And that's kind of an easy <laughs> win to understand that if we can reduce this by, let's say, 40%, it's going to fall right into the bottom line. Right. So I'd say our focus was much more on the bottom line. Yeah. And now the sustainability angle is, is growing quite significantly. That makes a lot of sense. You talked a little bit about the challenges around measurement for big corporates as well. What are some other challenges when it comes to you know, implementing a sustainability agenda that you see facing these companies? Yeah, I think there's, in our area, it's simple because there aren't trade-offs. But in most other areas, there are trade-offs. So it can be about cost, but it can also just be about um, how many things can we implement at the same time? And right. um, I'm actually a bit worried that, that the macroeconomic development that we see at this point will push companies to focus more on survival and you know, maintaining profitability. And then uh, sustainability might take you know, the back seat for a while. So it's really kind of a competition of priority and attention and available resources. That is quite tricky. But I guess if there are services like yours, right, that marry those two, okay, we're going to help you with the bottom line, but we also have this sustainability angle, then that's potentially, you know, a tailwind for services like tech like that, right? Because it's, again, super easy to explain internally and say this will actually help us, right? Yes, very much so. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So when we were catching up before this thing, 
we also talked about your journey, and you said that you had been in the business for 17 years, plus four and a half years of research, right? And I would love to know maybe a couple, couple of things, but first, how, do you, how has your relationship with your co-founders evolved during that time? And have you kind of like changed roles between the three of you? Um, how does that work? Yeah, so I think it's quite unusual to have the co-founders all stick along this long time and all ha have like really kind of operational roles, so being very much involved in the day-to-day -day business. I think we got, well, I, I kind of knew what I was getting into. I knew these people. I had worked with them. It's not like we were best of friends, but we had actually worked together, mm -hmm. and that's good because then you understand what it's like to work with these people. I had huge respect for both of them uh, from the get-go. Really right. smart people, really driven, really focused on delivering high quality. But what has kind of kept us together for so long, I think, is kind of a set of shared values. We didn't get into this to make, you know, a heap of money. Yeah. We went into this because we want to improve things. And that's the kind of biggest reward when you can see that, that we implemented this thing at this client. And now things are going better and we can measure it and it makes total sense. Mm. So I think that's kind of what drives us that we want the same things. And uh, that also means that I think the typical way of a founding team dissolving is that you have different views on, on the level of ambition or you know, how, how focused you are on making money or long term, short term and that sort of thing. We have kind of naturally been very aligned on those things. And do you actually sit down and talk about that stuff? Like once a year, do you get together and be like, okay, here's how we're feeling. We're still super excited about the business. What's our view for ourselves? Do you do that? <laughs> yeah, people sometimes assume that we actually spend time together. We spend very little time together because everyone's just super busy. Okay. So I think we mostly spend time together in, in like leadership team meetings or, or other settings where there are other people as well. Right. But I think there's quite a lot of inherent and trust that, you know, things are working unless you say that they aren't. Right, exactly. exactly. Uh, so, kind of, uh, we assume that everything's okay, and then we, we kind of also assume that people will speak up if it isn't. So, that saves a lot of time. So, Mikko actually once told me that if there's something you want, you have to spell it out, because I don't have time and I actually don't know how to do it. I can't read between the lines. And I think that's actually good advice for anyone. Totally, so. totally. Yeah, so you can be independent, but if you need to, you can just raise your hand and speak up. Yeah. Then I guess maybe one of my final questions to you would be, how do you keep yourself motivated through this journey? You know, you said that you and your co-founders were super aligned over your commitment to the business and your shared values. And so how do you keep showing up every day excited, as excited as you were backstage, and to build this business? Yeah, I'm still super interested in optimizing processes. Yeah. So I can't, you know, visit a cafeteria without having a look at, you know, oh, if that person would just be doing this <laughs> instead of that, it would just flow so much better. So I had the perfect platform of actually driving more efficiency. But then, of course, as the company grows, I feel that I have the responsibility and the opportunity to impact people's work life. Mm. So, like, things like congratulating every new relax dad that goes on parental leave and all these things that I feel are kind of super important yeah. for us to evolve as a society. I have my own microcosm where I can try to nudge people in good ways. I love that. Well, there's a food truck near my house in London that is very inefficient. So next time you come to London, please come and help them be more efficient. <laughs> Happy <Please>. to. <laughs> I feel like I, I learned so much from this conversation, from your journey bootstrapping to how you picked your investor to how you stay friendly with your co-founders even after so much time. Thank you so much for your time, Johanna. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you.